Hi, everyone. All right, what a crowd. This is awesome. I'm Winnie Lam, and it's my pleasure to host our guest, Premo Shaw, who is the president of Kiva to Google today. And Gary Bricks is from Google, and he's going to be hosting the this fireside chat, but I guess we're kind of missing the fire. I mean, the fire is in them. <laughs> anyway, um, let me tell you about Premo. So Premo is the president of Kiva. He first dreamed of internet microfinance back in 2004 when he was working at PayPal. And so at that time, he took a three-month leave and developed the internet microfinance concept in India. Well, he came back, didn't go back to PayPal, and uh, he came back, quit his job at PayPal, and launched Kiva thereafter. And today, Kiva raises over a million dollars every single week to help the working poor in 60 countries. Very impressive. Um, for Premo's accomplishments as a social entrepreneur, he was named a young global leader by the World Economic Forum and selected to Fortune Magazine's Top 40 Under 40 in 2009. And now let me tell you interesting things about Premo. <laughs> So Premo has been known to do the worm dance in weddings. So maybe, if we're lucky, we can, okay, so during the Q&A, one of you have got to ask him to do a demo. Okay, I, I didn't tell you about this beforehand, sorry. <laughs> anyway, so Gary um, is doing the, the chat with Premo today. And most recently, Gary is the Google's vice president of consumer marketing. And one of Gary's roles prior to coming to Google was at PayPal, where he headed up the global marketing team. And in fact, it was in the hallways where Premal and Gary first talked about Kiva. So without further ado, please help me give a really warm welcome to Premal Shaw and Gary Bricks. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm, so I'll just go through. What we'll do is I'll ask from a series of questions over the next kind of 40 minutes or so, and then we'll take uh, big questions at the end, so hopefully we'll elicit some, some discussion at the end. I also know Prem a little bit, as, as Winnie was saying, and he's a pretty humble guy, so I, I, it was exactly the reaction I expected from you when she started talking about your background. You're like looking down, very, very, very <laughs> shucks, it's amazing. So, um, and Winnie told a little bit about the story of, of how you got started, but I, I do remember there was a lot of discussion about the beginnings of microfinance in the hallways, and, and then you just, you, you just had this fire about getting started. So talk about the, the early bit of, of getting started. It was sure. pretty incredible. Sure. So, well, thanks everyone for making the time in the middle of your day um, to come here. And, um, uh, you know, one thing I wanted to talk about is uh, something that I'm sure uh, everyone in the room and everyone who is kind of watching uh, feels, which is um, at one point in your life, you may have had an experience with poverty. And uh, for me, uh, I was raised in a middle class family in Minnesota, in the suburbs of Minnesota. And when I was uh, five years old, my parents brought me back to India for the first time. And um, you know, um, there, was a, there was a memory for me that really affected me, which was I was walking through uh, a village, there's this town, Daboy, which is in Gujarat, the state of Gujarat, and it's where my uh, father was raised. And, um, it was rainy season, and um, you know the streets were pretty muddy, and we were in a, in, in a market. Um, and I was holding on to my mom's hand, and my mom ma gave me a one pesa coin to hold on to. Um, and we were walking through, and it was a little you know muddy. Um, and I dropped the one pesa coin in the mud, and my mom pulled me away, saying, "Oh, it's dirty." And uh, within seconds, a woman who was older than my mom. Uh, in a ragged sari, uh, walked over, leaned over very slowly, picked up the coin from that mud, and then pointed, you know, looked up at the sky and thanked God for finding this one pesa coin. And, you know, as a five-year-old, um, you witness this experience of what is such little money for my mom and what answers the prayers for someone else. It's this very confusing thing about the world today this inequality, the indignity of poverty. And uh, I know all of us have probably had an experience very personal with it. Um, and, and for me, I think from that time, fast forward kind of 15 years later, um, I was in college. And I wanted to do something uh, in India. Um, I didn't know what it was. And I was an economics major at Stanford. And um, 
I put together uh, this slide, and I just want to show it to you guys because I feel like a lot of us are kind of in different places of our journey. One of the most common questions I get is, how did you end up at Kiva? Right. Um, and so I wanted to just show this thing uh, because this, this really, um, I think, shows kind of the up and down path. So I, on, on, a, on a graph here, I charted kind of my level of aliveness um, over time, starting at the age of 20 um, to basically today, right? So it started with sophomore slump, um, and I discovered microfinance in a class. And what I loved about microfinance was it was a business approach to poverty alleviation. And I'm a huge believer in the markets. Um, I just don't think the markets always work for the poor. And so when I heard about what Muhammad Yunus had done and um, this kind of incredible intervention called microfinance, I tried to direct all my studies towards that. And I was lucky enough to get a, re a research grant from, um, from the university to go and study at the Self-Employed Women's Association, which is a large microfinance institution in Ahmedabad, India, and 700,000 members, and they do incredible work. And then like a lot of people who were gradu graduating in 98, I became a management consultant in New York. I don't know anybody who would put management consultant at the top. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was That's completely. It was um, like the same chart on that, that one point. The only validating thing about being a management consultant is you can create killer charts like this, <laughs> I feel like. But, um, you know, I, um, I don't want to bag on it too much. But um, it wasn't for me. And luckily, and I'm sure a lot of you guys are here for the same reason, um, I, I was lucky enough to join, um, you know, um, a company that. Um, uh, was doing incredible things with technology and so I was an early employee over at PayPal and and you know how fun it is to build things that millions and millions of people use and really value uh, and you guys feel this every day and it's it's like the most incredible company out there here at Google and and so you know it was so fun and so enjoyable um, and I learned so much about the kind of the revolutionary power of technology to connect people to create opportunity and we were acquired by eBay but at some point I experienced burnout and I really want to put this out there because you know, I don't know where everyone's at with their journey, but certainly I hit it. And for me, it was that three-month sabbatical that when he was talking about that absolutely changed my life. And I went back to India. Um, and um, that's where I was testing the idea of, hey, could you make a microloan to someone um, over the internet? Um, and it was when I came back, that's when I ran into you, Gary, in the hallway. And we were trying to brainstorm names. Yep. Um, uh, Gary and I didn't actually work together in the same group, but I knew he was like, a consumer marketing genius, and, and the, we, were, we had like a list of 100 names um, that we're trying to figure out what we should call this uh, website that allows you to make microloans to each other. You were telling me what, one of the ones earlier when we were talking about one of the ones you didn't go with, which I thought was pretty funny. Yeah, the leading name that we had was grassrootscapital.org, <laughs> and I loved it because it describes what Kiva does. Um, but then a friend of mine said, oh yeah, grassroots capital, yeah, legalize it. And, and, and so then I could never get that image of smoking grassroots capital um, out of my head. So you, it killed that name. You, you would have had the logo like that. Yeah, you exactly. Have absolutely been fine. exactly. So, um, you know, on this chart, uh, which is quite good, by the way. It's oh, very, well, very, well, very, well, very well done. Um, yeah. Um, oh my god, it's working. So, I mean, you, you know, the early days you kind of go through it, it's not all up and to the right. Everybody you know, people write about those stories, it's never up into the right, right away. But all of a sudden you started to see what was working. What, what started happening in the early, early days? Yeah, so I remember um, I left PayPal and Matt Flannery, uh, the co-founder uh, of Kiva, left his job at TiVo, he was a computer programming. And he jokes about, you know, he's pausing live TV and getting really good at that. And, and um, he had an experience in Uganda um, that transformed his life. And so we, were, we, we both quit our jobs, we're volunteering, kind of trying to nurture Kiva. Um, and I remember when you typed in Kiva into Google, the top was a result was a spa in Santa Cruz. Um, like it was completely, uh, we used uh, uh, um, Google Analytics really early on and maybe only 100 people would be coming to the website, probably looking for the spa. Only two or three of them would actually make a loan on the website. So you know, it wasn't looking very good. In fact, I looked in the database early on um, uh, to see if my parents had used the website. <laughs> and even they haven't used it. They were so pissed that I left like a, you know, a, a, a good <laughs> career job at PayPal for like, you know, a nonprofit. And uh, they were pissed oh, that I wasn't a doctor. Hopefully actually. they hadn't told you that they had used it. And then you checked the data. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It, bad, so like, you know, it, it, when you get something started, it's really hard to get the traction. And um, the moment um, that kind of that changed everything was um, about a year into our existence, we were uh, volunteers for about seven months, and then we knew we had to start putting people onto healthcare and at least paying some kind of living wage. So about a year into our existence, we had about a month left of um, uh, kind of cash in the bank. 
Um, it was about five people. Um, and uh, and in October 2006 absolutely changed uh, uh, you know, the, the course of Kiva, which is in that month, Muhammad Yunus won the Nobel Peace Prize um, for his pioneering work in microfinance. He's the founder of the Grameen Bank. They reach over six million families in Bangladesh uh, with loans and savings and insurance and a variety of services. Just an incredible, he's a saint who's walking on the planet today. Um, and then two weeks later, we were on um, PBS Frontline World, which is this 15 minute documentary that they created about Kiva. And um, it was on Halloween night, we're sitting there. Um, I remember we're looking at uh, uh, Google Analytics and we're gonna watch the traffic, you know, try to go up. And um, we're sitting in our Halloween costumes and e it hits on the East Coast and all of a sudden, the traffic goes down to zero. And what happened was that our site crashed. Because we're on this $22 a month server plan, you know. And it was so painful. For the next four days, our site couldn't get back up. But of course, on the internet, when your site crashes, it actually builds the meme. Yeah. And so that right there, more than anything, in fact, one of our engineers, um, he basically put up a little PayPal button that said, uh, you've melted our servers, help us buy new ones. And we raised, yeah, raised $130,000 from the internet community. Um, and that's what allowed us to get everyone in healthcare actually do real due diligence you know, on these organizations around the planet and, and get off the $22 a month uh, uh, server plan. So that, that, that was that moment in time that then from that point, um, you know, um, things really started taking off and people, yeah. the word started spreading. I, I'm, I have to admit, I was imagining you four days in your Halloween costume running around, you know, trying to make server I was work. in a penguin costume. Yeah, it's pretty ridiculous. So we should, I don't know how many, everybody knows exactly how Kiva works and you, you mentioned sure. a little about Grameen and, and uh, a little about microfinance. Can just, how does it, how does it work? How do, how do you get started? Sure, and business? just by sh show of hands, how many of you folks have made a loan on Kiva here in the room? Awesome. Wow. How many of you guys actually have money sitting in your Kiva accounts that you have to respend or relent to someone? Okay, um, there's about $25 million sitting in people's Kiva accounts that could be in the hands of the working poor. So just uh, keep coming back and relending that money. And we've just built an auto loan feature that allows you to automatically deploy it. But I wanna walk through the user experience of the website for those of you who haven't used it. So essentially, um, you, know, you come to the website and uh, you can go to our Lend tab and essentially, um, you know, we feature some loans across the top, like group loans um, that typically go to poorer um, microfinance clients. Um, right now we're featuring Arab youth loans. Um, uh, they tend to be um, uh, uh, slower to fund sometimes on our website. We find that women fund faster than men. Um, and um, anyways, you can sift through and, uh, the site and, um, I don't know, let's uh, pick uh, Tele in Togo, who wants $1,000 to purchase beverages. And so basically, um, what you can do is read a little bit about Tele. Um, she's posted by Akiva Field Partner, and this is what we do. Akiva is a, a nonprofit organization based in San Francisco. We have about 90 staff members um, around the world, and a big part of what we do is we go and find organizations uh, like uh, wages here, uh, and um, we basically look at their social performance, their, their work uh, in the community, um, and we give them kind of uh, some public badging, and then we assign them a risk rating, um, so a one to five star risk rating. If you're a five star organization, you can raise over a million dollars from the internet community on the platform. If you're one star, we start you off at $25,000. And so it's a way of basically allowing these organizations, we're giving them visibility and voice to basically raise money so that they can reach more entrepreneurs in their community. So they're the real heroes um, uh, at Kiva. They're the ones who are doing their hard work every single day on the ground um, in over 60 countries. So they've been on the Kiva platform for 50 months um, and they've posted up nearly 4,000 entrepreneurs onto the website. Um, Anyways, um, oh, and we use Google Maps right here. And you can kind of see where people from around um, the world ha are, have lent um, uh, um, uh, to this borrower, right? Um, so anyways, the way it works is it's pretty simple. Um, you can lend $25 or more. Um, and if you hit lend 25, one of the big questions that we often get is how does Kiva uh, pay you know, for the rent and um, for salaries. 
Um, about 60% of how we make our money is through tips. So like when you go to a, a restaurant, you tip a waiter an extra 15%. We um, ask you to kind of uh, throw in an extra 15% on top of your $25 loan. Um, and uh, on average, uh, you know, we get about 7% seven, uh, um, 7 um, so about half the people stiff us. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's those tips as well as kind of donations from foundations, corporations, and individuals that allow us to kind of expand into uh, some of the hardest to reach places on the planet. Um, and then a cool thing about Kiva is that it's a loan, not a donation. And usually every month, so the average loan term on Kiva is about 10 months and you'll get paid back in about in monthly installments. So if you lend $25, you'll get $2.50 emailed back to you every month. And that lands in your account as Kiva credit. And then once you get $25 back, you can turn around and withdraw that money or you can relend it. And most people choose to relend their money to another entrepreneur. Um, so that's the basics of the Kiva user experience. Um, and then you know, um, oftentimes you'll get a, an update on how the entrepreneur's business is doing. Um, and it's not always good news. Sometimes you know, businesses fail. Um, but uh, it's, um, what we want to do is try to just make, give a window into the world um, and make it as accessible and easy as possible for pe people to participate as business partners, not as uh, necessarily kind of, um, uh, you know, I, I'm your benefactor and you're my beneficiary, but really a partnership relationship. Talk a little bit about, um, when you mentioned at the beginning, just the, the throughput per week, and but give a sense of you know, scale and how many folks you are you reaching now. Sure, so Kiva um, today has reached 800,000 uh, small businesses, entrepreneurs, students in 62 countries. Um, um, the total amount that has flowed through the website is about $320 million in $25 increments from about 800,000 people on the internet. So there's incredible symmetry between the number of people who are lending on the website and the number of people who are borrowing. That's, that's a really cool thing. 80% of the loans go to women. Yeah. That's um, even bigger than it. When, yeah, when you said before, it's more women than, than men. Yep, yeah, it's yeah. more women than men. And um, there's a 98.9% .9 repayment rate on the website today. Wow, much better than mortgages in California. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, yeah, we did a graph between, I think, the S&P 500 over the last five years yeah. and kind of your Kiva portfolio and, um, you know, the working poor are outperforming, I think. Uh, um, some other. Some, some other asset say. classes, yeah. Um, you know, so you mentioned about, when you asked the group about uh, how many folks had, had uh, accounts with balances and you have an auto donate feature. Talk a little bit about some of the features, because you, you and I were talking about this the other day. There's some new features you have on the site. And some yeah, you're doing, so. yeah, so just to, just to show a few features on the website, um, um, one that I'm really uh, excited about is the community tab, right? So this, um, what we realized is that um, people um, doing social good can be a social experiment, or social experience. And one of the things that um, we kind of built uh, uh, without really thinking too much about is the ability to create your own lending team. Um, and so for example, the atheists and the Christians are the top two lending teams at Kiva, and they compete, they compete against each other. It's incredible. The third team is the mile points team. These are people who want to get uh, credit card points um, by <laughs> lending on Kiva, you know, uh, and then getting uh, the money back. Um, and then there's Team Europe. And then friends of Bob Harris, uh, this, this guy, uh, he, he's beating uh, the Australians. So it's really, it's really amazing. There's 22,000 teams. There's over 1,000 schools, 1,300 universities. There's, I think, a Google team. Let's see. It's a moment of truth here. Um, we're not beating Bob Harris. Yeah, you know what? We only have 58 members of the right. Google team here. Um, but you guys are, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's $40,000 lent. Um, it's a lot of Googlers are using the website, aren't, aren't even aware of the Google team. Yep. Um, consider it, um, uh, joining it, because it's a cool way to kind of uh, track your progress together as a community. Um, the other thing that Gary, um, you know, that you pointed out is the auto lending feature, uh, which is basically, um, I, won't, I won't demo it, but in your My Portfolio page, you can um, kind of set a few parameters, women, uh, women in Uganda uh, who are in agriculture, and then any time a woman from Uganda in agriculture comes on the website, yeah. it'll automatically deploy that money. Great. Any, any, um, should you kind of think about some of the, some of the, well, one of the things that's amazing is the stories, right, that come mm -hmm. out from the users and the folks you're helping, but there's so, probably, there's some incredible, even kind of somewhat bizarre, I guess, in some cases, but interesting stories of, of, of folks and who you're, who you're reaching. Yeah, you know, there's so many um, amazing stories throughout the year. And um, I mean, I just love 
um, reading through the site um, every day. And um, I think when you make a loan to someone, you get to participate in their journey as a, as a business owner. Um, and there's so many creative ways people um, uh, create a living for themselves. And so one of the things that I'm really excited about is um, kind of some of the new ways that our field partners are really trying to help the underserved. Um, if this room right now were uh, the country of Kenya, um, everyone from right here to here would be rural subsistence farmers. And um, one of the challenges is uh, reaching you with microfinance. It's so far. I mean, if, just imagine the most rural place you've been to. It's very, very hard and very costly to get to you. Uh, but then, um, you know, one of the organizations that I think is just amazing, we're working with this organization called Jehudi Kalimo. Um, and in fact, a Google employee helped develop uh, a, a management information system for this organization. It's, it's a really progressive org. But what they do is they um, provide a hybrid cow uh, to farmers. And a hybrid cow, what's a hybrid cow? Well, typically cows in that area deliver milk once a day. These cows deliver milk twice a day. And oftentimes, it's, it's called asset-based financing. So when you lend to a Jehudi Kalimo borrower on Kiva, instead of that borrower getting money, they'll get a cow. And usually, it's a two-for-one where the cow is pregnant. So it's amazing. And, and you're literally right there doubling the farmer's dairy income, right? And it's an incredible intervention. And they offer an insurance service. And you know, I mean, these are things that are happening all around the planet right now. I mean, another thing you that- You can't go on next. How does a hybrid, how does that work with a hybrid cow? And more, more fuel efficient. So basically, it's, 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 it's mixed with a European strain that is just a higher producing cow in terms of milk. Wow. But since it also has, I guess, local strain, it's, it's more, I guess, dr yeah, resilient. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, it's just, there's these interventions all around the planet that makes so much sense. I mean, we see things with solar powered cookers um, that can save the avoided cost from having to go and gather wood to heat and uh, light your home, um, or yeah, the, the, the fumes. The fumes, yeah. the fumes terrible, from yeah. from kerosene kill more people every year in the developing world than malaria. Yeah, respiratory illnesses, and one in three people live in energy poverty or completely off the grid. And so, you know, there's real costs. You actually, it's a poverty penalty when you're poor. You yeah. pay more for the basic services that the middle class and rich um, the uh, have access to. Go, to. The time that it takes to go get water, the time that it takes to the danger you run into of trying to go get wood. Um, it, is, it is pretty extraordinary. Yeah. Exactly. And so, so, so if you can get patient capital to finance basically you know, a technology like a solar powered cooker or being able to create a main line to the, to the direct water source, your avoided cost over time would be able to, you'd be able to make those monthly payments back. Yeah. Um, it's, I think the clearest example here in the U.S. is if the government said any vehicle that has over 50 miles per gallon uh, gets 0% interest financing for 30 years. It's like, you know, mortgages are 30 years long. So your monthly payments are so low that it's a no-brainer from your fuels cost savings to actually go and switch over. More American households would buy Priuses, et cetera. And so I think that's, that's the idea here is it, beyond just starting small businesses, there's a lot of costs that people pay that if they could, ex in exchange for small monthly payments, uh, a large lump sum, they could buy a technology that could change your life. Right. And get back, to, I mean, yeah, that's totally, and the time that, that it benefits too. I mean, so we were talking a little bit about the beginning and, and the idea of, you know, up and to the right, and you, you guys are still a, a small business, still out trying to uh, do what you can. What are some of the challenges you're currently facing in running the, running the company? Well, I think um, the two biggest challenges right now, one is, you know, for anyone who's read about microfinance in the last couple of years, um, it's not perfect. It's not a silver bullet. Uh, it, there's a lot of issues, and it's a very young, it's a promising development intervention, but it has its limitations. And one of the things that affects me the most is, we were just talking about Kenya. If you live in a rural area, the cost of getting you these loans, especially if it's $100, for this organization to be able to basically go out on its you know, moped two hours into the village and make a $100 loan disbursement, and then every week come back in a group meeting and collect a little bit each time over the next 50 weeks, is very costly if you look at the interest rates. And so one of the things um, you know, I, I really struggle with is how do you continue to make the costs go down for the world's working poor? 
Um, it's not risk-based pricing because most of the, we have 98%. Yeah, yeah that yeah. we have great rep repayment rates. Yeah. It's it's it, I think it's it's around um, how do we use technologies to make um, the credit appraisal as well as the disbursement and collection of cash. Um, um, how do we how do we address that? So that's that's one big challenge. The second big challenge is, you know, while microfinance today has reached about 150 million people, so it's pretty successful in its scale. Um, uh, there's about 2.5 billion people who are left out of the system today. And, um, and you know, I mean, if we go on to the Kiva website, when I was showing kind of that Lent tab, you saw businesses that were expiring. These are people who in this hour um, need a few hundred bucks and uh, they'll go unfunded on the website. And that's just a reflection of high impact but underfunded things that are happening all over the planet. This is just a window into that. And so what I want to do now, Kiva in the beginning, we kept running out of loans. Like every Christmas, you'd log into Kiva and there'd be, we'd be out of loans on the website because it's very challenging in low bandwidth environments to actually get these loans posted. Now we have too many loans yeah. um, and not enough people coming. So if you're ever thinking about trying Kiva, this is a big reason why I'm here at Google today. I've never done a, a talk in, in six years is I think now's the time to really get out the word um, and really spread it. And then what we do is we send a signal to NGOs all around the planet that, you know what, the internet community, it, it is a, it's, there's, it's a real source of patient capital. Yeah. And, and so those are, those are kind of the two big challenges right so, now. So just because um, we talked a little bit about this too, but digging into that, and you mentioned about 80% of the loans are to women, 20% are to men. Are there particular loan types that are more likely to close than others? Or you kind yeah. of see patterns in? What we see is women fund two times faster than men mm. on the website. Um, the agriculture sector, if you're, uh, that's the fastest to fund sector, uh, transportation, uh, is the slowest. Um, mm. You know, we see, for example, surprisingly, for example, uh, loans in Iraq were originally very popular, and now we've seen those expire more and more. I wonder if it's because of it's out of our consciousness. Um, uh, so we're starting to see these patterns, and what we want to do is just continue to layer on more and more uh, pieces of information so people can make decisions, uh, you know, not only with uh, their heart, but also with their head, yeah. and then just get the word out. Well, so you mentioned in the very beginning of things like Frontline, you, you can't have a Frontline documentary every day, but um, sure. in terms of getting the word out, it is, it is really hard. I mean, are there certain tactics that, that you've found that have been more helpful than others? Is it, you know, PR? Is it, is it AdWords? Is it, you know, other people telling other people? What, what, what works best for you in terms of growing demand? Because uh, as you mentioned, you've got a good supply now. Yeah, you know, one thing that we've done that, um, uh, was pretty uh, interesting is Reid Hoffman, uh, who is uh, the founder of LinkedIn, um, and he he's he's made a lot of money recently, and we <laughs> both we both work with him uh, at PayPal, and you know, he's on, he's, I see him on TV all the time. Yeah, he's, he's got, on Bloomberg. He's, he's got, got a his book. Own thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's I mean he's awesome. So what, what he's done <laughs> what he's done is he's like, look, I'm not going to go and lend twenty five dollars to people. Um, but he put out a million dollars to the internet community. And we converted that into 40,000 free $25 trials. And then we put that out on Twitter and said, use Kiva for free. And it's even on the header of our website right now. And um, you know, usually every month, 10,000 people will try Kiva um, with their own money. Well, in the month of March, 40,000 new people tried Kiva for free. And here's the genius of this program. When someone tries that $25 loan of Reed's money, they'll lend it to someone in Cambodia. And as that wo woman in Cambodia repays her loan, the money goes back to Reed. So Reed's real cost is the default rate on Kiva. Yeah. So although he's you know, mobilized a million dollars and 40,000 new people, his real cost will only be about 10,000 or $11,000. Already 12% have put in their own money and will probably recycle it over and over and over. So you know, those are some things, but I think it's really just an all out effort at building awareness about any cause. What we're trying to do is actually create a single brand and then behind what's happening is there's many NGOs and they're working in many different communities. And instead of having them spend money building their own brand, building their own technologies to fundraise, let's make it as sufficient as possible for them and create a simple consumer experience for people to connect with the work that they're doing uh, around the planet. Well, you, uh, you mentioned as you're telling stories a little about Kenya and, and, and PESA, I mean, there's a mobile technology. There's a, there's a lot of technologies that are now helping on distribution. Can you talk a little about what you're seeing on whether it be outbound or inbound. Yeah, I think the, the, the coolest thing in terms of um, financial services for the poor, uh, uh, the big game changer is mobile finance. Uh, I'm sure many of you here have heard of M-Pesa. 
Um, uh, M-Pesa is a, a mobile payments technology in Kenya. And what it allows you to do, Gary, if I, um, I can kind of send you money stored value to your phone, then you can go to a local gas station and send the gas station owner um, money and he will pull money out of his till, uh, Kenyan shillings, and give it to you. So everyone kind of almost turns into an ATM machine, if you will, right? Yeah. And um, it's about four years old. 78% um, of the adult population in Kenya uses it. 25% of the GDP now flows through this M-Pesa mobile payment system. It's incredibly promising. In fact, there's this, uh, there's this quote um, by William Gibson. Uh, he talks about uh, the future's here, it's just not evenly distributed yet. And everyone talks about the Sil Silicon Valley and what's happening out here, but I, I wonder why Kenya is so far ahead in terms of mobile payments. It's incredible because what it does is, for people who live in rural areas, the cost of actually getting them a loan has completely collapsed, yep. right? And we're doing a pilot now with Kiva where in, instead of having a microfinance institution in the middle, we're actually doing something where if you've gotten a loan on Kiva before or if a church group can vouch for you, you can get listed up in Kenya. And we have 80 borrowers in Kenya. It's a pilot called Kiva Zip. And then when you lend money to that person, within minutes the money goes to them at 0% interest. And their incentive to repay is a future loan that will be cheap. Just like, this is why we pay back our credit cards, because we don't want to ruin our credit score so that we can actually get future access to opportunity. And so uh, the M-Pesa system, you know, we think, combined with crowdfunding, can really collapse the cost. Um, the, the cost of, for example, accepting savings. You know, a savings is really expensive for banks to offer to the poor because you can't charge an interest rate. Um, you actually have to pay out a little bit on the deposits. But now people are saving money on their, on their cell phones. And there's this great quote from this woman that I heard uh, uh, on, on Kiva in Kenya who said that, my husband may make, try to break into my phone, but he'll never be able to get the money off my SIM. So what it does in terms of women's a people's agency no, within the household. Get loans, yeah, the well, you know, it's, I think it's, it's a game changer. It's allowing yeah. people to have the security, the privacy, yeah. the convenience of mobile finance. I think that's, that's, that's something I'm really excited about. And the distribution power, I mean, obviously the distribution power is extraordinary. I, mean, I, I had a chance to be in Kenya with the tribesmen about three years back. And I was trying to take a photo of him, and he had a robe, and he kept covering. He had a um, Kipling case holder, I remember, and his cell phone. You know, and this is the middle of nowhere. And, he's, and I was trying to take a picture of him, and he's trying to cover it up because he didn't want, you know, any photo of him with a cell phone. But the distribution of these and the ability to to move money on him is could be really transformative for so. what you guys are trying to do. Okay, so we have a lot of. It's great. We have a really great turnout. A bunch of folks. In about a couple more minutes, I'd ask you guys for questions. But what what can Googlers do to help you guys? Sure. Well, um, just your existence is awesome, and I want to honor that, honestly. Um, we I think we, we mostly agree with that. Most <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I say this from a, a place of, um, we were, tr were counting up uh, the other day the number of services we use um, from Google. And, um, you, know, uh, for, you know, we're on Google Apps uh, to, um, you know, using the maps on every single borrower page to we're really trying to drive more video on the website because uh, that, that seems to resonate with the internet community, and so yeah. we're working with Hunter Walk and his team at YouTube right. um, to uh, just, I mean, just, it's ridiculous. And you hear this, I'm sure, from all sorts of website owners. But I just want to thank you guys for, and you guys do it at a, at, at a price and a quality that really enables uh, NGOs around the planet to be more effective. Um, so that's really, I just want to honor that. Um, Couple things, you know. Obviously, there's making a loan. You can get involved um, by volunteering at Kiva. We have a program called the Kiva Fellows Program, where you can go out to the. We'll train you in San Francisco in our office uh, for a week, um, and then we'll ship you out to one of 60 countries where you can get uh, an experience. Uh, you know, helping uh, build that local uh, field partner and and their work with Kiva. Um, we've had over 450 Kiva Fellows now in the last few years, and a lot of Googlers have done it. Um, um, you know, I, I know you guys have uh, peer bonuses and spot bonuses here, and uh, you give out cash. Well, we have Kiva gift cards, right? And it's kind of like cash, because you can give someone $250. They will then just have to, the only conditions, they have to lend it out to someone. And then over the course of the year, they'll get paid back, and they can withdraw that cash. So you know, it's simple things like that, just weaving it into our day, um, that uh, in a, I think the person might appreciate it uh, just as much as cash. Um, I, yeah, that, those are some of the ideas that we have. Um, and, and then, you know, if people are interested in uh, um, doing something like what Reed did, 
um, or just kind of doing a bulk loan on the platform so that the internet community, particularly I think classrooms around the world, if we can let them try it for free, I think that's a really exciting thing. And I want to make this as, I mean, it's just, we know when something's, it's the one penny problem, if you can make it free, um, more people will use it. And then over time, um, you know, people may put in their own money. So those are some ideas. Great. I mean, the idea of, of rather than a spot bonus, so you get a, a Kiva. Kiva gift Kiva card. Kiva care or something yeah. like that. Be, that's a really great idea. Love that. Okay, so uh, if there are questions, what we'll do is you can uh, just stand up or raise your hand if you have a question, and then uh, hopefully if we can hear it, we'll repeat it just sort of for folks on, on BC. Yes? The, the profiles of the people that you see here, typically what happens is the nonprofit partner that we work with or the NGO will predisperse the money because we don't want these people to wait for the loan. And then they backfill the loan. So while they're fundraising, the average loan profile on Kiva gets funded in about three days. But if it goes to th day 30 and it's not 100% funded, it expires off our website. Um, now, when you make a loan to Luciana here in the Philippines, if she defaults, so if her business is not successful, then you and the 20 other people who've chipped in to fund her loan will lose your money. So your repayment is tied to her success. But in terms of like, what happens if the, she got the money but it didn't get funded at the key, so who's covering That's where the local field partner eats the loss, and that's the risk. And then the more that happens, the less people in their community that they reach. And then you get your money back, and hopefully you'll recycle it. But suppose that, OK, so what about the business of, like, I put in $25, but she hasn't reached her $300 maximum. It's still counted towards what goes to her. I mean, does that go immediately? I think the question is, does it have to be? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, okay. so what we do is that we have an all or nothing model, which is once it hits its fundraising target, then what we wire on a monthly basis to our field that. partners. And, and so if it doesn't hit that $300 threshold, then that, none of that money goes to that field partner. It actually goes back to the internet lender, and it goes back to your Kiva account to, to put it somewhere else. And it's, what like we a, it's like a Groupon tip. The, the, the loan has to tip over in order to reduce. We so should, I might put in $25, and it will sit there for 30 days, and then I'll get it back. And that's, it won't have done anything. Exactly. Yeah. And, exactly. And today, that happens probably, um, it's the minority case, but it's happening at an increasing rate. Just because no. you're getting more requests for loans, so. Yep. Yeah. Okay, yes. Okay. It's important to keep in mind, one of the best books I've read on microfinance and financial services for the poor, it's called Portfolios of the Poor. Um, and the, the situation is um, uh, much more complex than village money lender bad, Kiva good. It's actually, if you're a poor household, chances are you'll have loans from multiple sources friends and family, your neighbors, a uh, microfinance institution, some from a village money lender. And what, what we'd love to do at Kiva is make the internet community part of that mix. Because we think the internet community will be more patient and do it at a lower cost than the village money lender and even some other formal sector things. Um, and so my sense is that right now, um, maybe some of our, some microfinance institutions or money lenders would be upset about the internet community doing it. But I don't know. I, I, I mean, you guys deal with this all the time. There's existing ways of things, and then technology can create a new way, um, and, and it, can, it can create more value for people. And um, you know, we try not to uh, get too bogged down by that. What's well, not like being in Brooklyn? They have to travel a long way to get to you, so I mean, that's, you feel personally. Yeah, that's, 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 that's right. Yeah. Um, yes? I want to show you guys something that I think is one of the coolest things that just happened in the last few months. We launched. Uh, um, the ability for you, what's your name? Alex. Alex, you can vouch for someone. We're, we're going to roll this out. It's right now, it's a password protected limited pilot thing that we're running. You can vouch for someone who you think is underserved that is a small business, say, maybe in the Tenderloin in San Francisco. Okay? And uh, this person, they might not have a credit score that allows them to get a loan from a bank. But if you know their character and willing to vouch for them, for example, we're working with Glide Memorial Church in San Francisco, that if they know someone in their congregation that they really want to back, they can vouch for them. So I want to show you what we're doing now within the US, because people are more online, right? So here is Victor. Victor runs Cafeto Coffee Shop uh, in San Francisco, California. And this is this Kiva Zip you know, experiment that we're running. And um, he basically, you know, he got paid out via PayPal, his interest rate 0%, and it's a 12-month repayment term. 
The people who vouch for him is the Mission Economic Development Agency in the Mission District in San Francisco. Victor graduated from one of their business training courses, wants to start, set up a coffee shop, um, and the internet community basically um, has helped him raise his, his $5,000. And now he's running his coffee shop, he employs five people part-time, and he's paid back 43% of the loan. Now here's where it gets, I think, really amazing as people, as, as, as the underserved, as the working poor come more and more online. Victor vouched for his friend Ernesto. So Ernesto is a taxi cab driver who wants to buy a taxi cab medallion in San Francisco. And you can see that now Victor has endorsed Ernesto. And Ernesto and Victor, basically, we, uh, the, here's, you know, here's the experiment. We, we, the hope is, is that uh, Ernesto will really want to pay back because Victor's reputation is tied to his repayment. And this is a way that I think we can reach people at a cost structure that, um, you know, um, you know, it's like trust networks, essentially. Yeah. So we're really excited about this Kiva exip experiment. I don't know if this is going to work, but this is, I think, we can test a lot of the edges of innovation here in the US um, because people are more connected um, and it's easier to reach them and do these pilots and PayPal. We can get money to them. And we're also running this pilot in Kenya because of M-Pesa as well. There's a question just behind Alex. So yeah, sorry, yeah. So I think it's kind of an incubator question. Are you helping kind of incubator type activity? Yeah. You know, that's a really great idea. Um, I, you can imagine that Victor and Ernesto, um, you know, as, as there are more and more of folks just here in the San Francisco Bay Area who are using Kiva to make their case to the internet community to get uh, loan funds, patient capital, that we could uh, layer in other value added services. So for example, I don't know, you know, Google has a small business unit and maybe you guys have training and you know, we could develop a module, it's like a, key, it's a Kiva Google boot camp for entrepreneurs who want to now bring their uh, business online. And, and these two businesses might not be online, but I'm sure there, there are ones. Or for example, we could use uh, the reputation systems that you guys have developed, um, you know, the community feedback score on, on small businesses as a, as a, as, as a way to actually um, get, get raise money on Kiva. So there's so many things that we could do. We're really early in kind of thinking through how to layer it in. But I, I think there's a lot of promise. There's a question over here, I thought. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. That's great. So I'm familiar with Wokai, and um, you know, I'm, I'm good friends with Casey, uh, their CEO and co-founder. And um, you know, I think it speaks to the plight of, um, it's really hard to, it, it, it's, 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 it's Kiva for China. That's what Wokai is. And um, they've been at it for a few years. And just in May, they've had to close down. And it's really hard to find funding and keep going. And unless you get that kind of, uh, you know, flywheel effect or that traction, it's um, it's really hard to make this model work. And so one of the things that we want to learn from Wokai is actually take a lot of the learnings in China and figure out how we can actually lever this platform, all of this goodwill that's been built, to get into China um, more efficiently, so that for every dollar spent running Kiva. Um, we can, you know, have even more levered impact. As, and so this is this is the case for actually nonprofits actually coming together and consolidating more. Um, um, and sometimes failure can be good. There's there's that Darwinism because that way we can kind of focus our resources and get the most that's impact. Right, yeah, that's great. Was there a question in the front row? No, did you have a question? Oh, I had one up. Okay. You did. Okay. Uh, over on the wall. Yes, please. So just to summarize your question, um, a few things. One is. Um, uh, around interest rates, too, is just around how this money is spent, loan capital spent. Is it consumptive or is it for productive purposes? Um, those, it, was, it was in that set. Uh, sure. So here's what, I mean, what you guys do at Google, you guys are going to be part of this overall solution where the world's going, which is as we get more insight into small businesses, so as you get cash register data, one of the loan types that we're doing now in Kiva um, is, uh, for example, you know, if, if we ha if there's, uh, you know, if this guy has, I guess, Google Wallet or a Square device to accept the credit cards, that, could, that data could then basically show up to Kiva lenders, right? And what we could do is lo structure a loan so that a percentage of revenues actually up to a 0% return, or maybe one day if the SEC allowed it, you know, you could even get for-profit returns, who knows? But that, that kind of data insight could actually get us get a better sense between uh, people who invest and how that money, uh, you know, how that money is used and, 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 and the, the income generation. The, the truth, though, is for the working poor, these loans oftentimes are subsistence loans. 
And the most valuable thing about the loan is the ability to cope with a crisis, whether it's a medical emergency, a funeral expense, you know, kids going to school. Yes, it's consumptive, but it comes into the mix in the household in one bulk sum and in exchange for small affordable repayments over a longer period of time. One thing that we screen for at Kiva is over indebtedness. That happened here in the US with the subprime meltdown, which is oftentimes people, you know, credit can be debt and it can really work against you if you don't know portion control or if it's not done in a fair, transparent way. And I think there's some cases, for example, in southern India, um, uh, you know, by some for-profit microfinance organizations, which I'm a huge fan of for-profits. Um, I want the poor to be able to take advantage of profitable services. Uh, but sometimes that motive for growth, growth, growth um, uh, comes at the expense of responsibility. And so we have to be really mindful about how to be responsible lenders. And there's things around pricing transparency, fair collection practices. Um, and I think the, the industry, especially in southern India, there was a, a, a pretty stark reminder of when microfinance can actually harm and not help. And so we want to screen out for the, the right organizations that um, have a much more balanced view on growth. That's, that's our perspective at Kiva. So we probably have time for, for two more questions, so um, just go to the, the wall. Yeah, the question was about fraud. And fraud <laughs> absolutely happens all the time. And um, you know, one of the things that... We used to say, I mean, we used to say at, at PayPal, you, you know you're successful when the fraudsters come after you. It's just, it's the way, it's the, <laughs> it's the nature, sign. it's true. It's the nature yeah. of money on the web, unfortunately. Yeah, early on too, when we didn't have very good due diligence practices, we were defrauded all the time. Um, and, and now we're still defrauded, but less so as a percentage of the loan volume. Um, in fact, I think the first 10 field partners we signed up, I think eight of them we've had to close down because of malfeasance or just, they, we, we just didn't know what we're doing. Um, and, and, you know, I think the thing, we know fraud and corruption, this is a fact of life, this is the way the, this, the state of the world is. What we want to do is just put a little sunlight on it, right? So by having an internet platform, so you can go through our field partner page and see the 30 partners that we've had to close out of the 200 because of problems. And you can read why. And hopefully a future donor or future funder won't come in. They'll Google the, the partner name in, you know, Cambodia or in the US or wherever. And they'll say, oh, you know, it looks like they had some problems on Kiva. What happened? They can read about it. And we invite the organization to state their case. And we just want to put more sunlight on all of this. Um, and, and, and that way, um, you know, people don't throw good money after bad. People who, who uh, defraud Kiva have a special place in the afterlife, I would think. Uh, they, they, you know, it, 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 it teaches us. And, you know, yeah. even with the zip model, without an intermediary, there will still be, you know, yeah. Victor and, and uh, Ernesto could collude. Yeah. Right? I mean, we haven't seen that yet. It's still a really small pilot. So it's just it's human nature. There's always some bad. The question is, can we minimize the bad so that we can allow all this good to flourish? I love the fact that you do keep it up there and you kind of shine a light. That's actually a great practice. So let me, last question just in the... Well, I'm a big believer in doing the smallest possible thing in the present moment and trying to smallify things. I mean, I think what Kiva does so well is we all know the world's problems. Um, and I think there's compassion collapse. You start hearing these stats, one trillion this, one billion that. And um, we just want to make this human scale and make this something that people can do very quickly, very simply, with a low barrier to entry. And then I th just think that, how do we move that practice, that mindfulness into what we're doing every day? And that, you know, we, I, hopefully that answers your question beyond like kind of like making a loan is, you know, I don't know, take a breath. Um, you know, be grateful for the place and time that we are uh, in right here. I mean, what a joy uh, to, to, especially to work for a company that, you know, I mean, the whole, I really believe in what you guys are doing. And um, you guys spend a lot of time and resources on things that don't seem to have an immediate economic return for the company. And I, I really, I think you guys walk your talk. Um, and so, oh, around do no evil, and th I really believe that, I see that for the last, 10 years or whatever. So, um, you know, I just savor the time that you have here. Um, and then, you know, more than social entrepreneurs, people who quit their company and like go leave and start something, social intrapreneurs, the amount of change you can make with, with, the, with the resources here at Google banding people together. I mean, you know, we want to create, for example, uh, some kind of, I was talking to uh, our lead engineer last night. It's like, you know, what would be helpful for Google engineers to do? And he's like, well, we could use help if you guys had a sabbatical program here. Uh, we're right here in San Francisco creating, uh, he called it a, an open source playground 
Because there's so, the, ideas of li the list of ideas is so long, but we're, our ability to get them done is just, you know, it's very slow. And so if we could open up the ability for all in developers to come in and develop things and, and through some kind of stage gate path put it up onto the website, that would really unlock the potential of this. And this is only one of the websites. All these other systems, like the, the systems that our uh, field partners use around the, the world, I mean, they all need a lot of uh, engineering love and attention, for example. So um, get involved with local nonprofits that do global things or things in your own neighborhood, yeah, too. Like we need a hackathon at Kiva, I think. Yeah, we should do a hackathon, that's for sure. All right, I think, uh, I think we're running run out of time. Promote's great. I mean, I, I'm, it's a great um, audience in terms of turnout and things like that. You, you, you've been incredible for the time I met you in the hallway, so keep, uh, keep going at it. It's, it's having a huge impact in the world, so thank you. Cool, thanks. Yeah.